Bible study, and we've come to dig into the Word of God this evening. My text I want to focus on is John 3.16. Very familiar portion of text. John 3.16. Those of you who are online, there are notes in our, at our website. I apologize for those of you who are in-house. For some reason, they didn't get made, so you can get them when you get home. John 3.16. I'll be reading from the NIV this evening. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And my subject this evening is good news. Good news. Let's pray. Father, we just come to you right now as we open your word. We pray, God, illuminate it to our hearts and to our minds. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 2020. What a year. Man, I need some good news. I need some good news. You know, we look around, we, we find ourselves bombarded on a daily, dare I say, hourly basis with a litany of bad news. This country, the world, has been beset by, the, by a relenting plague called COVID-19. And as a result, there's been economic upheaval that's been attributed to this pandemic. It's been affected 20 million people out of work in the United States. Miles long lines to food banks frequented by what used to be middle class citizens and greater than 50% of small businesses that have closed their door, doors never to open again. There's been government failures at all levels, and we have seen erosion of our basic safety and security needs, food, shelter, health, confidence in tomorrow. And moreover, we've seen catastrophic natural events on a grand scale never seen before. Wildfires, we just had a two big wildfires yesterday, destroying millions of acres of land and with devastation of personal property. People becoming instantaneously uh, homeless after losing everything except their lives. We've seen conga lines of 20 plus horrific hurricanes that include tornadoes hitting our southern borders and then meandering up the eastern seaboard. Earthquakes swarming and occurring in highly unlike, unlikely and unexpected places like New Jersey. And let's not forget the escalating racial tension and, and division, the social unrest, the, the social injustices and the inequality proliferating throughout the land. In addition, we've seen a host of misinformation filtering through our society from a variety of so sources, some unsuspecting that they are, uh, are being played with people preferring to believe false narratives as opposed to the truth, even when it is undeniable. Folks, we are experiencing the outer bands of the Great Tribulation. And where can one turn? Where can one turn? Well, despite the fact that there is so much bad news, fake news, however you want to call it, circulating today, I do want to call your attention to some good news. And we can all pre appreciate some good news. In fact, as I mentioned earlier, that's the title of my message this evening, Good News. And so for the next few moments, let's take a deep dive into the text, John 3, 16, which will be the foundation for our learning this evening. And why John 3.16, you may ask? Well, as some of you may know, it's my favorite verse. It's my favorite life verse. And secondarily, it's also the name of the church where I was baptized in water and in the spirit. Iglesia de Juan Tres Dieces, John 3.16 Church in Bronx, New York, over 50 years ago. But beyond those personal reasons, I believe it is the greatest, most precise, and compact expose of God's provision for mankind. 
And notwithstanding that, many have unfortunately ignored God's mercy and the richness of this verse. Nevertheless, it stands as God's ultimate guarantee to you and me. You see, this verse succinctly embodies and descriptively lays out God's plan for salvation, yours and mine. And in it, we see the who, the what, the where, the why, and the how, all leading up to the ultimate outcome of salvation and revitalization of our spiritual man so that we can achieve our full potential. So let's get busy tonight. Let's unpack this great verse. John 3, 16. I'm going to break it down word by word just about. And it starts off, for God, it's the, the who. The first thing we talk about is the who, it's for God. And we look at that word for, and for implies that, that God had a choice. It's a choice that's over and above. He didn't have to do what he did, but he chose to do it. Jesus said over in John 15, 16, he says, but I chose you. I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. The verse could have been very well stated by saying God loved, but it doesn't say God loved, does it? It says for God loved. That was not the case. For God loved. You see, we have this, this preposition for placed in front of the word God. And that implies to me, and hopefully to you, intentionality that goes far beyond a simple performance of duty. All right? When we talk about for, it's something that's directed towards. Something's done to the benefit of someone else. It's intended to be received by somebody or aimed at someone. It's indicating a reason why something happens. And that's all found in that one word for, for God. And so moving forward, the balance of the verse clearly lays out why he did it, did what? Well, that's the action that's described in the body of the verse. For whom he did it, what he did, how it was to be accomplished, all culminating in a very specific outcome. So who or what is God? I mean, we've got to start here. Let's, let's go back to basics. Who is God? And I don't mean that disrespectfully, but, you know, let's just quickly define who God is. You know, I, know I, don't, I know I don't have a lot of time here, but, you know, let's quickly define God and, and let's describe who Jesus is and let's try to explain the Trinity in, in five seconds or less so we can get some additional clarity as we go through this. But let's talk about God. Who's God? Well, God is the, is the all-powerful, the all-knowing, the ever-present creator of the universe. And he's worshipped as the only, underscore, only God. As it says over in Deuteronomy 6, 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Isaiah 4, 3, 10, Before me no God was formed, nor will there be one after me. And apart from me there is no Savior. John 1, 17 tells us, Jesus speaking, I lay down my life, and no one takes it from me. Let's talk about Jesus. Let's look at who he is. And Jesus Christ, is, as the word tells us, is the agent of creation. He is the embodiment of salvation. John 1.1, 1, 1, let's go right to the very beginning. It says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God. And the word was God, and he was with God in the beginning. And through him, through him, all things, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. In fact, in him was life, and that life was the light of men. And then we skip down to verse 29 where it says, look, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, talking about Jesus Christ. And then quickly looking at the Trinity, the Trinity is the God, the Father, 
Jesus Christ, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, the Trinity, the Godhead. And notice, they are equal in association. They are all part of the Godhead. But yet, they are diverse in operation. They have unique and specific roles. As we note in this verse, we have to ask ourselves the question, why did God do what he did? And that brings me to our second point this evening. Because as we continue to look at the, the verse, it starts off for God, but then right after that, it says, for God so loved, right? For God so loved. Folks, every word that's used in scripture is precious, and it's vital, and it's poignant. And then as the, as the Apostle Paul noted, he says over in 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture, not some, all right? You can't cherry pick the verses you like. You know, you can't go for the ones that make you feel good and the ones that don't make you feel good, the ones that make you feel uncomfortable. You want to push them aside? No, 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 no. You can't do that. But all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching and rebuking and correcting and training in righteousness. Why? So that you and I may be thoroughly equipped. If we are going to be equipped to live as citizens of the kingdom, we need to understand the scriptures. We need to be in the scriptures. So why did God do this? Because he so loved us. God doesn't just love us as, as empty words thrown around devoid of any feeling or consequence. It doesn't say he loved out of a passing fancy. Now, sometimes how we use the word, the term love, you know, we say we, I love you, but we really don't mean it, you know. You know, how, you know how you do that. I love you. Yeah, I don't really like you. Can't stand your dress or your, your shirt, your tie, or whatever. But we say it anyway. But not God. He doesn't say he loved out of passing fancy. It wasn't love of indifference. It wasn't love of no consequence. But rather it says that God so loved, so loved, and that, that's, that word so is, is, is indicative of intensity. It doesn't just say God loved, but God so loved. He was fervent. He was intense about it. God so loved. In fact, if you look at the Amplified Bible, it renders it as he greatly loved us. This is love that is over and above. Friend, this is love without compromise. Not just love, but, but as it says in the Amplified Bible, prized love. This is love of a higher order, on a higher plane, done so without recognition. It is, it is a love. Where, where God gives something of great value without knowing whether anyone will accept or appreciate it. As Paul noted over in Romans 5, he says, and I love this verse, I love this verse, at just the right time, not the wrong time, not too early, not too late, but he said, at just the right time. And what was the right time? When we were powerless, as it says. And what happened? Christ died for the ungodly. Christ died for you and for me. And it goes on in verse 8. And it says that God demonstrates his own love for us. He shows us how much he loves us. And how did he do this? It says in the word that while we were still sinners, while we were still sinners, 
while we were in that muck and mire of sin, while we were back there shooting up, while we were drinking and getting loaded and doing all these perverse things, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Christ died for us. And this, folks, is what we call agape love. A love that's wholly selfless, selfless and spiritual that has been provided to us with grace and mercy. Jesus said over John 15, greater love has no one than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. Wow. I want to be a friend of Jesus. Do you? I want to be a friend of Jesus. You see, God expends his love without any assurance of his acceptance. And that leads us to the target of this love, my third point this evening. For whom? For whom did God do this awesome, awesome thing, this awesome feat? Who did he do it for? For whom did God make this ultimate sacrifice? Was it for a select group of people? No. Was it for a select region of the globe? No. Is it relegated to a particular ethnicity or cultural group? No. Was it for a particular point in time? No. Well, then who? Well, what does the scripture say? The answer, the world. The world. For God so loved the world. You see how this is fitting together in the scripture here? I mean, we're getting the whole plan of salvation in this one little verse. For God so loved the world without equivocation. This sacrifice that he's making is for everyone in the world, past, present, and future. But it's for everyone. Jesus said over John 10, 16, I, I like this verse. You probably read over this. You even know it was in the Bible. It says, because you know when Jesus came, he came first to whom? He came first to the house of Israel. He came first to the Jews. But look what he says in John 10, 16. He says, I have other sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. And he's talking about who? The just us, the Gentiles. All right? They're, they're, he, he's saying, there's, there's more than just the Israelites. There's more than just the Jews. I have other sheep in this sheep pen. And he goes on, he says, I must bring them also. I love that. He, he didn't forget about us. He didn't forget about you and me. He said, I'm going to bring you along. If you want to come on this journey, I'm here ready, here ready to take you on this journey. And he, he goes on and he says, there shall be how many flocks? One flock. There shall be one flock and one shepherd, Jesus Christ. You see, Jesus didn't just come for the Jews. As Paul notes in Romans 10, 12, he says, For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. It is the same Lord is Lord of all. And over in 1 Timothy 2, 4, he wants everyone, it says, wants all men, women too, children. He wants everyone to be saved. That is, that is the heart of God. The heart of God is that you all be saved. Here in the sanctuary, those of you who are out there online, he wants everyone to be saved. And not only to be saved, but also to come to the knowledge of truth. You see, it is a universal gift, one that has eternal consequences that are priceless. So where do we find ourselves? We find that God is being intentional about something. 
He did it out of perfect love. And he has targeted everyone in the world. So what is it? What did he do? What was so special about this verse? Which brings me to my fourth point. What? What? He gave. He gave. What did God give? His one and only, his unique son, Jesus Christ. And why do, why do, why, why do, we, why do we say unique? Well, he, we say unique because he was different from everybody else. He was different in a way that makes him special. He was one of a kind. There are not multiple Jesus Christ running around. There's only one. There's only one Jesus Christ that's part of the Godhead, that was part and parcel in the creation. In other words, there's none other like him, no other name. As it says in Acts 4.12, uh, salvation is found in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to men by which you must be saved. It's not Buddha. It's not Baha'i. It ain't the Pope. Okay? It's not Ronald McDonald. It's only one name. Jesus Christ. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. And, and, and sometimes we, we, we don't catch the, the import of that when we read it. Because we see that, we, well, he gave his one and only son. But what we don't realize is that he gave a piece of himself. Because Jesus Christ is God too. So he gave a piece of himself. God gave a part of himself to pay the ultimate penalty for sin. Paul writes in Romans 8, 1, he says, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sin, sinful men to be a sin offering. You see, God went beyond a temporary covering of man's sins as we see what, what had occurred in the Genesis account. Let's go back to that because sometimes we miss that. But all the way back there in the beginning, in the beginning, you know, that's a whole nother sermon. But Genesis chapter 3, starting in verse 6, we all remember the, the story. It says, when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom. And you know, that's been the basis of every sin that has fallen since then. You know, we're always looking for something that is, looks good to our eyes. You know, we want to make us smarter and more wiser. And, and, and we love our food. We love our food. Amen? Oh, come on. You guys, you're not saying amen. You're lying if you don't say amen. So she took it. She took some of that fruit. And she ate it. And you know, misery loves company. So she gave some to her husband. Now remember, before this, God had already told them to what? Do not, you, you, could, you could go anywhere you want in the Garden of Eden. I, Eden, I believe it was a, a huge garden. Sometimes we think of garden like the little thing that we do in our backyard. No, no, no. This, this was huge. Think like Amazon jungle type huge, okay? This is huge. And, and they had the run of the entire garden. They could do anything they want. They can go anywhere they want. They can eat from any tree they want. God said you can have your, your life of any tree except one tree. How is it? I don't understand our human nature. <laughs> when, when you've got, when you got all the goodies around you, anything you want, and somebody says, you can do anything you want with all this stuff except for that one thing. 
And then what, where do we focus in on? On the one thing that we can't have. Why is that? Why is that? And that's what happened with Eve and Adam. And so they focused it on this one thing. And God told them, do not, do not eat of that fruit. You can have anything else. So here's Eve. She ate the fruit. And, uh, you know, she said, wow, you know, let, 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 me, let me bring Adam in on this. Pretty good. You know, this is some good fruit and making me feel good. And so she gave some to her husband. And like most men, they always do what their wives say. Amen? This is where it all started, guys. And he ate it. And the Bible says that immediately the eyes of them were opened. Which is interesting because their eyes were opened anyway. But it wasn't talking about physically, right? It's talking about something else. Metaphysical, spiritual. And they realized they were naked. Now, I don't know if you saw this, but it says in the Bible that they were naked. Well, guess what? When they were created, they were what? They were naked. I mean, they didn't come into the world, you know, with an Armani suit or anything like that. Okay? They were naked. And they were okay with that. <laughs> there was nobody else around anyway, right? Who cares? They can run around their birthday suit all day long. There was nobody. They, was, they were free. You know, this was, this was a perpetual Woodstock, okay? They were naked. And so they sold fig leaves. I hope it was fig and not, you know, poison oak or anything like that. They sold fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. And it says in verse 21, And God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. Did you ever wonder why Adam and Eve made coverings? I always pondered that. Why? What was the rationale behind making clothing for themselves? There was nobody else there. The birds didn't care. The animals didn't care. Well, the answer is, when their eyes were open, they realized that their disobedience to God's word was exposed. And they were trying to hide that disobedience. You know, it's, it's like when we sin and we try to hide our sins. Now, I think I told you a story years ago when I was a youngster back in New York. And, and one of the things that we used to do, this is, uh, this is when I was only half saved. And, and so, um, yeah, you know, sometimes you're half saved and a little bit better than half saved. But, but anyhow, uh, we, we used to go to the candy store and, you know, being poor, uh, we didn't have a whole heck of a lot of money. In fact, we didn't have any money. So sometimes it gets hot in the summertime, so we decided to do a five-finger discount. You, so if, you, who know what a five-finger discount is? When you pilfer something, okay? When you, and uh, I tell you, after doing that, even though we didn't get caught, because we get this stuff, we take off head for the lot and everything else, we didn't get caught. But you know, it, it, it didn't taste right because our conscience started beating on us saying that you did something wrong. And this is what was happening in the minds of Adam and Eve because they realized they, they were, their, they, they, their, their disobedience was being exposed. And so what did they do to try to cover up, cover up their exposure? They, they made these cheap coverings out of fig leaves. Yeah, I don't know if you've ever seen a fig leaf, but it's not very durable, okay? And uh, it, it's, it's a mess when it gets wet, so you just don't want to hang out with that. But they made coverings with fig leaves. But God steps in, and he makes them some durable garments that were designed to withstand the environmental changes that were brought on by their sin. He went and killed animals. 
He shed blood to cover their sin, which is a type looking towards the cross when Jesus Christ, the perfect sacrifice, would shed his blood not to cover our sins, but to completely wash our sins away. You see, God, what God did was to provide a permanent solution. And the Bible says that the end result of sin is death. But Jesus Christ came to change that outcome. We know these verses, Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans 14, 9, Christ died and returned to life so that he might be the Lord of both the dead and the living. Why, 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 was, why was it so important? Why was it so crucial, critical for God to give his one and only son as a sacrifice for man's sin? Why, 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 why did he do that? Well, you see, Christ is the only intercessor between God the Father and you. There's no other intercessor you can go to. You can't go to Pastor Mike. I mean, you can go to Pastor Mike and ask him to pray for it. But you want an intercessor? You go to Jesus. Because Jesus got the hookup. Okay? He is the only intercessor between God the Father and you. Jesus Christ is the remedy, as it says in John 3. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. Jesus Christ is our nourishment. Uh, Jesus said in one, another place, I am the bread of life. And who, he who comes to me will never go hungry. And he who believes in me will never be thirsty. Jesus Christ is the only source of truth. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. Jesus Christ is our Savior as it, as it says in Acts 4.12, salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which men must be saved. Jesus Christ is the only foundation, for no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. The fifth point deals with how? How? And as the verse says, whosoever believes. So how will the outcome noted at the end of the verse be accomplished? This selfish giving was targeted to whom? To everyone who believes in Jesus Christ. No, you don't have to pay for this. You don't have to have indulgences. Okay? No Hail Marys here. Only requires belief. To everyone who believes in Jesus Christ. In other words, belief is trusting, it's, it's faith, it's hope, it's conviction, it's confidence, it's expectation, it's dependence. Belief is also clinging to. It's, 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 it's grabbing on, it's hanging on, it's, it's cleaving to Jesus Christ. Belief is, is relying on, it's, it's counting on what he can do for us. Belief is being sure of what he can do for us. And the only requirement is to believe in Jesus Christ. It's that simple. My goodness. This is not rocket science. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him, and the scriptures here note a specific posture that must be held by you, me, and those in the world. Belief. And what does that look like? What does it involve? It involves, first of all, hearing God's words. Secondly, it involves believing in God who sent Jesus. And therefore, therefore, we are able to cross over from death to life. And that's why the Bible says, I tell you the truth, Jesus speaking, I tell you the truth, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me, who sent me 
has eternal life and will not be condemned. Belief, certainty, acceptance, conviction, faith. I like what it says over in Hebrews, the faith chapter. Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. And then go down to verse 6 where it says, and without faith it is impossible to please God. And anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists, that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. And so this all leads up to a very important consequence, important as important for you and me. It's my last point this evening. And that is, it is an outcome that comes from this, an outcome that is twofold. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have ever or everlasting life. It says in King James, NIV says eternal life. Two things. The first is that if we believe in Christ, we put our faith and confidence and trust in Jesus Christ. The first thing that we can be assured of is that we will not perish. We will not come to an end. We will not cease to exist. Some people will say, well, does that mean that we will not die? No. Everybody's going to die as a result of original sin. You are going to die. However, what it means is that you're not going to uh, perish permanently. You see, there's an opportunity here to continue in a dynamic relationship with God forever. But those who reject, who reject this offer, who reject God's offer today, will see a permanent end to their existence. In other words, they'll be forever cut off from God when they leave this body of clay. You see, God never meant for man to perish because he's desirous of having an ongoing relationship with mankind. That's why he stuck it out with Adam and Eve. When Adam and Eve sinned, I mean, he could have easily toasted them and started over. But he didn't. He wanted to work through them. He was going to provide for them. And he started working his plan. And that plan comes right down through the century, right down through the ages to today. God never meant for man to perish. He wants a relationship with us. But that cannot happen, my friends, with sin in the picture. Check out some of the promises that God has put in his word for believers. He says that he will give us bodily supplies over in Psalms. We all know this scripture. Uh, Trust in the Lord. And do good, so shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. He gives us unlimited blessings. Jesus said everything is possible for him who believes. He answers our prayers, our requests, every time that we talk to him. He says, therefore I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. He gets rid of the obstacles allows us to become part of divine sonship. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Becomes, in other words, become heirs in the kingdom of God. He promises us eternal life. He gives us spiritual fullness. I like what it says over in John 6, 35, I am the bread of life. And we read this. He who comes to me will never go hungry. He who believes in me will never be thirsty. He provides us with spiritual lights. I have come into the world as a light so that no one who believes in me should stay in darkness. And he gives us power for service. It says over in John 14, 12, I tell you the truth, anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. He will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. And he gives us salvation, the best gift of all. I am not ashamed 
I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, first for the Jews, then for the Gentiles. So the $64,000 question this evening is this. Do you have a right connection? Do you have a right connection with God? And I'm talking about, have you come to the point in your lives where you have renounced your worldly views? Where you're now having faith in Christ? Where you are performing spiritual service? Where, you're, where you have now become, instead of self Selfish, you have become self-sacrificing. You know, it says in John 12, 25, a man who loves his life will lose it, while the man who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. We're expanding our knowledge of God. I like what Paul said to the, the young minister, Timothy. He said, study, study. That's a word for each and every one of us. Don't put your Bible underneath your pillow and hope the word's going to leap through your pillow to your brain. It don't work. I tried it. You have to read. Study. Study to show yourself approved. All right? A workman that needeth not be ashamed. Rightly interpreting or dividing the word of truth. And in sowing to the spirit, the one who sows the spirit pleases the spirit from the spirit will reap eternal life. And the second aspect of this outcome is that not only will we not perish, but we will be recipients of everlasting or eternal life. A life that is not subject to the frailties of human existence. An eternal life not subject to the final destruction reserved for Satan and his demons along with those who deny God's existence and reject his free gift. We see that a couple of verses down from John 3, 16, where it says, whoever believes in him, who Jesus Christ, is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned. Already. So if you're here or you're out there and you do not believe in Jesus Christ, you're already condemned. You need, you need to check yourself. You need to check yourself right now. And you need to make a decision. Where are you going to be? I mean, if you don't like hot weather, you better get in with Jesus. Because I can tell you, hell is going to be a lot hotter than Yuma. Whoever does not believe stands condemned already. And so to this we see the mission of Jesus Christ in verse 17. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. And that, my friends, is good news. That's good news. Think about it. God so loved you that he sent Jesus Christ to pay the penalty for your sins. And as a result, you can have eternal life. If only you believe and accept Christ as your Savior. It's up to you and to me to accept God's offer. The offer's out there. He's not going to twist your arm. He didn't twist the arm of Adam and Eve. And if he didn't do it to them, he's not going to do it to you. The offer is out there. The Bible says in John 3, 33 through 36, the man who has accepted, accepted what? This gift has certified, has certified that God is truthful. And goes on and tells us that God gives his spirit without limits and winds up saying whoever believes in the son has eternal life but whoever rejects the son will not see life 
for God's wrath remains on him. I don't know about you, but I don't want God's wrath to be on my life. And I want to spend eternity with him. I do not want to be separated from him. So this evening, you have decisions to make. You have a decision to make. What's it going to be? What's it going to be? Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word this evening. Simple word, one verse. One very powerful verse. And this evening, we challenged your people to look introspectively and to make a decision. Are they for you or against you? Are they going to believe in you and accept the offer that you put on the table? Or are they going to reject you? They know the consequences. It's all laid out. This point forward, no excuse. No one can say, no one didn't tell me because they've all been told. They all know. And so now they have to make a decision. And I pray that you work on their hearts this evening. Those that don't know you, know you, that God, that you tug at their hearts until they come to you. And for the rest of us, I pray that you fortify our spirits, that you build us up. Yeah, we're going through difficult times, but yet there's nothing too difficult for you. And so God, just surround us with your love. Watch over us. Take care of us. Protect us. I thank you, Lord, for the attention of your people. I pray that you bless them. In Jesus' name, amen.